Hey everybody, I just wanted to apologize for the fact that this kill count is blurred to shit. It's because of YouTube content guidelines, even though, you know, we spend the whole time uh, explaining the meaning of the movie and showing you how the, all the effects are done. Uh, I guess that doesn't matter, so. We hate this, we're sorry, but, uh, you know, we can't risk the video getting restricted or else it'll get hurt in the algorithm, etc., etc. So, apologies for that. Watch the movie for the unblurred stuff or check out our Patreon for a dollar. All right, enjoy the show. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Smile, released in 2022. Smile follows Dr. Rose Cotter, a psychiatrist who's stalked by a demonic entity after witnessing the death of a patient. When Smile first came out, a lot of people compared it to Truth or Dare thanks to its use of demonic curses and toothy grins. That's a superficial comparison, though. Smile's much more serious in tone, landing closer to prestige horror than popcorn flick. It has an almost Ari Aster weight to it, with heavy themes of death, trauma, and mental illness. Some horror movies, I mean most even, are more fun than they are scary. Smile is not one of those movies. It is an unrelenting experience with little levity that writer-director Parker Finn wanted to feel like a constantly escalating nightmare. I think he succeeded. That's not to say it's an unenjoyable watch though. Far from it. I love the way it looks and feels, with long unbroken camera shots and a tense abrasive score from composer Cristobal De Vere, who would go on to do the fucking awesome opening theme for White Lotus. Looks like he used some unorthodox instruments to capture suspenseful sounds. <laughs> Smile also features incredible performances and a whole bunch of solid jump scares. If you don't want the best ones spoiled, make sure you watch the movie before this video, and the trailer for that matter. It's a testament to Smile's quality, and its release date, I suppose, that it wound up being the highest grossing horror film of 2022, a year chock full of great horror. Right off the bat, huge content warning for this one. Smile dives deep into topics like suppressed trauma and grief, and the curse kills people by using their own bodies against them. That might limit how we talk about things in this video, but we'll do our best because this movie deserves it. Can our characters grin and bear the scares or... <laughs> they took the bait. I'll be right back. There's been an increase in phishing scams around the dead meat office. Seems like someone's targeting our employees. I got this text supposedly from UPS saying I had an urgent delivery that needed rescheduling. And normally I wouldn't fall for something like that, but by pure chance, there was a attempted delivery slip on my door that day. And I was at this Maisie Peters concert, trying to enjoy the music, trying to enjoy time with my friends. So when I saw the text, I just, wanted to get it dealt with. Phishing scams use imposter links that look similar to or exactly like the original. Then paired with a website that looks official, they're able to get you to put in your private information, passwords, credit card info, whatever they can justify. The moment I hit submit, I realized my mistake. I changed my passwords as quickly as I could, but by then it was too late. It was good he realized so quickly. Not everyone does. Learning to recognize it is the first step. Keep an eye out for contact from accounts you've never seen before, or a sense of urgency to get you to click. They're all red flags. But you can get more help with today's sponsor, NordVPN. With the ability to add Nord to six devices, you can get encryption on your computers, tablets, phones, the works. And NordVPN's threat protection feature is designed to protect from phishing. It keeps you safe when browsing and protects from malware by scanning downloads for malicious content. That's all Ben can do, but that's not all I can do. I laid a trap for our fisher, and he took the bait. Ha! <laughs> Zoringa Voyage. A long time ago, we used to be friends. Now he's fishing the team, but why? I've got too many questions swirling around my head. These questions need answers. That's what I do. But that doesn't have to be what you do. Avoid scams and take advantage of NordVPN's birthday deal by getting a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus four additional months free with nordvpn.com slash dead meat, or click the link in the description. That's nordvpn.com slash dead meat for the best deal on the internet, all risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Can our characters grin and bear the scares, or will they fall victim to lurk and smirkin'? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with a bedside death stare. We'll get more context later, but an excellent rotating continuous camera shot shows us that, my god, this woman had a family. One of them, a young daughter named Rose, is standing in the doorway staring at the body of her trauma mama. Rose Cotter grows up to become a therapist in an emergency psych ward. She treats patients like Carl, who sounds like he's outlining a kill count script. He's gonna die. She's gonna die. She's gonna die. I'm gonna die. Everyone dies. Carl! You gotta add behind the scenes info these days. She tries to calm him down by saying his fears are all in his head. I know. 
that what you're experiencing feels real, but it can't hurt you. That advice is gonna suck real bad when it's reflected back onto her later. Rose is a workaholic and is running herself ragged, so she's sent home by her boss, Dr. Morgan Desai. He's played by Cal Penn, one half of Harold and Kumar, and one-time co-star of Chelsea's. Right after Rose leaves her office, her phone rings, and she just can't help coming back to take the call. It'll end up being the worst decision of her life. The call leads her to treating Laura Weaver, a grad student who claims she's being stalked by something only she can see. It looks like people. But it's, it's not a person. It follows, it follows rules, taking the form of both strangers and loved ones. But hey, at least it has a good attitude about it. It's smiling at me. Oh, that's nice. But not a friendly smile. It's the worst smile I've ever seen in my life. Oh, that's not nice. Laura's played by Australian actress Caitlin Stacy, whose hysteric performance is the perfect way to set up this movie's monster. She makes me terrified just from the fear she has describing this thing. I've never felt scared like I do when I see it. Rose points out the pink elephant in the room and asks if Laura or her family has a history of hallucinations. Laura pleads her sanity, but pretty soon she seems out of her mind. <laughs> Rose runs to the phone for help, but come on, Rose, don't stop looking at her. Turn around. There you go. Oh, maybe that was a bad idea. Rose finds Laura with her frown flipped upside down. While there is CG in this movie, none was used for the titular expression. Director Parker Finn believed keeping them practical would add to their uncanniness and keep them from looking too goofy, unlike some movies. Laura goes from creepy to cryptly when she uses a flower vase shard to put on a second smile. It's slow and brutal, painfully drawn out, and rivals the one from the Nightmare remake. Actress Caitlin Stacy tried to play Laura like a desperate animal. She's basically just become an instinct rather than a person. She's actually reprising her role from Laura Hasn't Slept, the short film that Smile was inspired by. Writer-director Parker Finn was excited to expand the short into his first feature, and he knew immediately that he wanted to work with Stacy again. There was nobody else in my mind that, that could have played that role. I, I, I wrote it specifically for Caitlin. The opening kill gives Rose more trauma, and us a title, 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 car, 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 Rose is questioned about the incident by a couple of detectives, one of whom isn't exactly sympathetic to the victim. Them. Yeah, she sounds fucking crazy to me. She tries to tell them where the trouble began. That smile, that damned smile. It's left her shook up even after she gets home, but the movie says no to a fridge stock jump scare. Perhaps it could interest you in something darker though, like something from their hereditary selection. Rose. <laughs> Rose gets dinner with her older sister Holly and her brother-in-law, friggin' Greg. They question why she bothers with this job. Why become a doctor if you can't get disgustingly rich? Friggin' tech vest Greg. He's a rare spot of humor in this movie thanks to actor Nick Arapaglo, who previously played a cop in Freaky. Rose tries to find comfort in her the boy's friend Trevor, who's a nice guy. Goes well with their nice house, a nice kitty who greets Rose at the front door. But things aren't nice for Rose, who keeps seeing smiling ghosts and smiling patients. Wait, you saw that, right Rose? Yeah, you can't miss smiling Carl there. His usual predictions of death all of a sudden become more pointedly personal. You're going to die. You're going to die. Rose freaks out and calls a code red, but it should have been a code bed. Carl was just taking a little nappy by. Doesn't stop the hospital Gestapo from going all in on him though. The mix-up earns her a checkup with Morgan, who isn't like the malicious malpractitioners of Countdown and Happy Death Day. He's a genuinely good boss who cares about his staff and patients. He's just bogged down by higher-ups and shitty insurance situations. The board is down my throat about paying out of pocket for another bed in the residency program. Well, maybe you should have helped Obama craft a better bill, Cal. Concerned about Rose's mental health, Morgan tells her to take a week off so she can get her shit right side up again. Before she leaves, one of the detectives from earlier drops by to check on her. Joel is an ex-boyfriend, though, so Rose rejects his help, despite how charming he is. All that charm comes courtesy of Kyle Gallner, a three-time Kill Count vet and certified modern-day Scream King. He's nominated for a prime rib at our upcoming Dead Meat Horror Awards for his role in The Passenger, which we also interviewed him about. Check out that movie and those videos. Rose tries to calm down with a bottle of wine at home in the dark. God damn it, another glass rose? I need to take a trip to Macy soon. She finds the back door open, then gets jump scared by a phone ring. It's the security company asking why the alarm went off. The back door of my house is open. Are you alone in the house, ma'am? Yes. Are you sure? I love how Smile expertly combines jump scares with genuine creepiness. Look behind you. Like, no fucking thanks, lady. I'm good on that. Rose hears another ring and realizes she hasn't even answered the phone yet. She's just seeing and hearing things. I mean, more things. It, you know what I mean. Even worse than having hallucinations, Rose can't find her kitty mustache. Oh, his name is Mustache? Oh my god, he's such a cute kitty! She has a stress nightmare where a spinning shot of her dead mom match cuts to her waking up in bed. It probably conveys the fear and sometimes reality that mental
mental health issues can be hereditary. Rose gets up and listens to her audio recording of Laura's last session. And man, as soon as she zooms in on those sound waves, you know we all about to get fucked. <laughs> Super fucked. And sure fuck enough. Scared, Rose brandishes a knife, which Trevor doesn't appreciate when he runs in to see what's going on. The deluge of despair sends Rose back to her own therapist, Dr. Madeline Northcott. Northcott brings the conversation around to Rose's mom's death and asks if Rose blames herself for it. Rose deflects and asks for some mm, drugs. Northcott responds with, hmm, drugs? Instead, she prescribes a change of pace and tells Rose to go to her nephew's upcoming birthday party, which Holly has been bugging her about. Jackson's seventh what? birthday party. I've told you like five times. I can't, I have work. Well, can't use that excuse anymore. Kumar sent you home. Though she doubts gray skies are gonna clear up, she puts on a happy face and shows up with a gift wrapped in the finest, loudest wrapping paper she could find. The party is a slow motion cakewalk at first, but when it's time to open presents, her nephew Jackson finds an unhappy unbirthday surprise in the box she brought. It's Chekhov's dead cat. Mustache has been murdered and gift wrapped. This was actually a completely digital creation since Finn was unhappy with the dummy used on set. You can only tell if you're really looking for it though. Naturally, Rose is blamed for the party foul, and her cries of innocence aren't helped by the merry monster only she can see. The other guests mustache if Rose is doing okay. She's not. A jump scare sends her crashing through a table like she were Jill Roberts. Oh man, that's nasty. They didn't sugar glass coat that injury at all. Her boss, her sister, and her boyfriend are all very concerned right now, but Rose can only focus on how ironic it is that a smile has become such a terrible thing. She tries to explain everything to Trevor calmly and rationally, with the caveat that it will be hard to believe. But when she says she's being targeted, targeted by the unseen entity that killed her patient, Trevor blows it off as ghost talk and his support quickly melts away. Do you hear yourself? I mean, Jesus Christ, you sound crazy. I am not crazy! Sorry. Sorry. He decides to take the A train out of this situation and blames Rose's breakdown on her family's history of mental illness. Now on her own, Rose decides to do some digging into Laura Weaver. A police file reveals that Laura saw her professor Gabriel Munoz kill himself with multiple bludgeonings using a hammer. Rose visits the professor's home and talks to his widow Victoria, pretending to be a reporter. Victoria tells her a now familiar tale. Gabriel started acting weird, seeing hallucinations, and then killed himself. They asked me to identify his body. <laughs> his face? Not only is that a very ring-like scare, it also gives us a kill to count, since Gabriel Munoz is no longer just a picture or a police report. He's a messed up face that you'd probably want to scrubs from your memory. Victoria takes Rose up to Gabriel's study, where he'd been drawing some of the things he was seeing. I see someone was a fan of Clive Barker. Whole lot of creepy art here. And in the attic of Munoz stands a solitary smile at the center of it all. Oh. One of the cheery chumps in Gabriel's artwork is his brother, who died in an accident 20 years ago. It's another part of the curse that matches Laura's experience of seeing a loved one die. Sometimes it looks like my grandfather who died in front of me when I was seven. This curse affects people who have experienced extreme trauma, much like mental illness itself. Also like mental illness, the curse can affect anyone, regardless of how nice their life is or how educated they are. I'm a PhD candidate, I'm not some lunatic. Like many horror movies, Smile has a metaphorical layer, but what makes it work so well is how much it's steeped in clinical understanding. So many of the characters clearly don't understand how to talk about mental health. She was a head case, yeah? That was a whole box of fruit. Meanwhile, Rose, a trained psychiatrist, bristles at this language. She knows how to phrase things properly, like she does after Victoria reveals that her husband first started acting weird after he saw someone kill themselves. He watched someone die by suicide? Rose pushes for a name, but accidentally slips that she's not a reporter, causing the widow Munoz to pull a Tara Carpenter. Get the fuck out of my house! Victoria is played by Judy Reyes, best known as Carla from Scrubs. She followed up Smile with an excellent leading role in another horror film, Birth Rebirth. Out of options, Rose does what many people do in a crisis. She hits up her ex. I need a favor. I need you to not ask any questions about it. Terrific. Yeah, let's hear that. While Joel's initially skeptical, he hears her out more than Trevor did and agrees to play laptop cop looking up crime scenes and police reports. Oh shit, what's got him reacting like he just saw new taint? Oh, yep, yeah, that'll do it. That ghastly image is of Angela Powell, a woman who killed herself at a business conference. Gabriel Munoz witnessed the act, but we didn't, and since we only have a picture, I won't put her on the count. They trace things back further and learn that Angela also witnessed another suicide shortly before her own. This one has video in the form of a surveillance cam, so I can count the guy who Angela 
Angela saw pull a backwards the burning at a gas station. Now that's a look of sheer terror. Rose gathers up the evidence for a paranormal presentation, but she comes home to an intervention with her therapist. Trevor's trying to get her help. Whether it's for her sake or his own is up for debate. All you're trying to do is make it so you don't have to deal with it. I think this is an important angle to address in a story about these themes, but I wish we had seen more of Trevor striving to have this perfect easy life Rose accuses him of wanting. I mean, yeah, he didn't listen to her about an evil entity, but he did put up with her sister and tech vest Greg. <sighs> Freaking Greg. Speaking of whom, Rose tries going to her sister for help next, but Holly doesn't want to look at her folder of X-Files. Their argument reopens old wounds. Holly abandoned their mother when her mental illness became too much to handle, leaving Rose alone to find her when she died, which is what we saw in the opening scene. Rose resents Holly for moving on so quickly, while Holly thinks Rose is stuck in the past. Words are said, feelings are hurt, and Rose ends up crying in the car. Aw, buck up. Check it out. Your sister's already coming to make amends. Holly. Man, I wish that absolutely brilliant scare wasn't spoiled in the trailer. Although it was always funny hearing people scream at it in the theater. In any case, Rose's poor nephew Jackson sees her screaming through the window, underlining Holly's charge that he's been forever changed. You've completely traumatized Jackson, okay? Sosie Bacon does a great job portraying the toll this curse takes on Rose. Bacon's no stranger to the horror genre. She had a recurring role in the Scream MTV series, and her father is Kevin Bacon, former Crystal Lake camp counselor. Sosie had to act in pretty much every scene in Smile, which co-star Kyle Galner described as a 90 minute long panic attack. Her character is almost always on edge, stressed out, and terrified. That takes a real physical and mental toll, but she more than rose to the occasion. She is legitimately like everything you want out of a co-star. She's everything you want out of a number one on the call sheet. While midnight munching, Rose gets a call from Joel, who's discovered her connection to the chain of victims they were looking into. He's also discovered that none of them survived longer than a week, meaning Rose's countdown is almost through, since she's already on day four. She gives Joel the lowdown on her smile demon sorrows. I'm gonna need you to say something. I, 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 I will. Just, just... <sighs> Unlike Rosa's other loved ones, Joel chooses to believe her and offers to help. He's found a single survivor in the long chain of victims, an accountant named Robert Talley, who's currently incarcerated for murder. They pay a visit to the prison, where Joel's cop connections buys them a sit-down. Rose asks him how to stop the curse, y you know, for, for a uh, friend, so he tells her some new info about a previous chain. A man there escaped that chain by killing his neighbor and passing it to his neighbor's wife. He explains how the demon spreads through trauma, which is why its victims approach a witness before dying. The demon wants to mess someone up by making them see a violent death, and that allows it to be passed on. Tally was only able to escape the chain by murdering someone else, which passed the curse on to a bystander instead of himself. Because this thing needs trauma to spread. That's what gives it power. Trauma. Rose accidentally reveals that she's the latest recipient. I can't kill someone! <laughs> And boy, does that cut their meeting short. Get away from me! Get away from me! Actor Rob Morgan was last seen on the show on the other side of the law in Stranger Things. Though he's only in one scene, he committed entirely to his character's intensity. I approach that one scene as if it's the entire movie. Stuck between a rock and a homicidal place, Rose returns home to her kitchen knives and crime scene photos. Another reminder that pictures of dead people never seen in video form don't go on the count. And don't bring up Alex Browning in Final Destination 2. We knew that guy from the first movie, okay? Rose gets a house call from Dr. Northcott, who's very concerned about how they left things yesterday. Yesterday. The two have a sit down, but it's interrupted by a phone call from Dr. Northcott. I'm very concerned about how we left things yesterday. Phone Doc must be the real deal, since Phony Doc is suddenly smiling. Almost time, Rose. <laughs> Why did that almost sound like Tim Robinson? Almost time, Rose. Gotta admit, I don't like how much this scene humanizes the entity. I don't like hearing it talk or laugh. And I think this drooly close-up is a bit too much. Then again, it's a nice little reference to Alien 3, which had effects by Amalgamated Dynamics, who also did the practical effects on Smile. The encounter sends Rose running to the hospital to hit her make-dead deadline. She runs into Carl, who she seems ready to kill, but she still needs a witness to pass this thing on. Good thing Morgan walks in just in time to see her stab the shit out of Carl. Oh, that poor man. The stabbing was actually retimed in post-production in order to give the knife more resistance as it's pulled out of Carl's body. No kill graphic here though, since Morgan's banana peel face is a good sign that Rose is just dreaming. Turns out she was just taking a steering wheel nap. Rose's outfits over the course of the film were carefully put together by costume designer Alexis Forte. She wanted them to reflect Rose's degrading mental state, going from polished and professional to, uh, let's just say work from home. She also used yellow to hint at hallucinations 
hallucinations. Face Ripping Morgan is wearing a yellow tie, but Real Morgan has a greener shade when he finds Rose in her car. Real Morgan invites her inside, but Rose decides not to pass the trauma on, which means she has to get away from everyone else. That concerns Morgan, who notices her car seat cutlery and calls the cops after she speeds away. Joel calls Rose and offers to help again, but she decides to leave him on red. Since the demon needs witnesses to spread, Rose plans to isolate herself in her abandoned childhood home. It was mentioned earlier by Holly. I don't understand you, it's literally just sitting there. We grew up in that house. Rose, it's a total teardown. Why not just get the money for the land? Yeah, well, no one asked you, Greg. Wow. Rose takes a trip down memory lane where we find out what really happened the day her mom died. Turns out, Rose didn't discover her mom after she died. She was still alive. Confused and scared, young Rose ran away rather than call for help. A fearful reaction that led to her mom's death and has haunted her ever since. The house's flashlights are past their expiration date, meaning Rose is stuck with a Bray Wyatt lantern. She's awoken later by the sound of weeping in the bedroom and finds her mother, who yells at Rose for not calling for help. I was 10 years old! doing all that she could. It wasn't easy for her to be a scared little girl without good motherhood. The reunion goes rancid as Mama Bear grows to barbarian sizes and comes through the doorframe like that guy in It Follows. Finn wanted this form to represent how a 10-year-old Rose would have seen her abusive parent. While Rose's mother is played by Hungarian actress Dora Kiss, this aptly named Nightmare Mom is played by Kevin Kepi, a creature actor who recently appeared in Cabinet of Curiosities. He also played Kevin the Crypto Alien in a promo directed by our friend Kira Gardner. Nightmare Mom gets up close and personal, looking all sorts of Marilyn Manson, which is when Rose gives her a fiery facial. The move is surprisingly effective, resulting in an extended burn that melts this mama like a candlestick. While this flaming finale was done using CG, the filmmakers did actually send a stuntman on fire as a visual reference. I think the initial fire burn looks a little too digital, but when the nightmare mom is all melty and crawling towards Rose, I love it. It looks fucking dope. Due to the fire stunt, production had to build Rose's childhood home as a set for greater control. The connected interiors were all built on a stage, while the exterior of the house was just a facade, surrounded by blue screens for digital extensions. Production also had to build their own hospital sets, since the movie shot during COVID when real hospitals weren't exactly available for filming. Rose locks up behind her and lets the house get warm and toasty. She takes the scenic route back to the city, where she deposits herself on Joel's doorstep. In a vulnerable scene, Rose apologizes for how things ended between them. I put walls up, and I kept people at a distance. I met you, and I could feel those walls coming down, and it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> she asks him to stay with her for the night, something Joel is more than happy to do. Uh, a little more than more than happy to do, actually. I'll stay with you forever. Son of a bitch. Jolly Joel chases her back outside her house because it turns out that was all just another hallucination. God damn it! The real Joel has managed to track her down, though, and Rose runs back into the house in an attempt to keep him away. Inside, Slender Slipknot makes her return and freaking splits her face open to reveal the demon's extra toothy grin. Holy shit! This is literally the stuff of nightmares. And the disturbing imagery continues as the smile demon stretches Rose's mouth open and climbs inside. What? The sequence was a batshit blend of digital effects by the artery and practical effects by the legendary amalgamated dynamics, whose early work was referenced in that drooling scene. Mixing mediums was the approach to a lot of the film's effects, like Laura's death, which had digital enhancements but still used a practical prosthetic and half a gallon of blood. It all looks so damn good. It's one of the best combinations of special and visual effects I've seen recently. This final form of the demon, known as the Monstrosity Mom, was performed by Marty Matulis, who's played creatures in American Horror Story, Sleepy Hollow, and Studio 6. He wore a full body suit with puppeteers to help control the demon's extra long limbs as he reached out and stuffed his head inside a practical rose dummy. Wow, this fucking rules. <laughs> Joel manages to break through the door, but by the looks of the gasoline and that ghastly grin on her face, it's clear that Rose isn't the one driving anymore. The movie ends as she lights up, searing herself into Joel's mind and passing along the curse in the process. God, what a fucking bummer, man! How many people flashed pearly whites on their way to the pearly gates? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, have you seen Lucy? Founder. Oh, okay. Whew. All right, let's go. <laughs> 
counted five kills in Smile, since I didn't count all those crime scene corpses. The victims consisted of two men and three women, giving us this lopsided smile of a pie chart. We've seen this count and breakdown in five previous films on the kill count, and with a runtime of 115 minutes, Smile gave us a kill on average every 23 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Laura Weaver. It's an uncomfortably well done throat slit, and really sets the tone for what's to come. The almost for lamest kill will go to, uh, no one, since it feels vaguely disrespectful in this context. And that's it! Smile came out in 2022 and has a sequel slated for release in October of this year. I'll probably cover that when it comes out, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count for Smile. As I'm filming this, I'm hoping that this episode is able to be released without incident. YouTube has gotten so strict about depictions and even mentions of self-harm in the past, like, just year, really. We're doing our best to make the videos not restricted, but they'll still have the warning. Like, you can't avoid having the warning, even if you just mention that a character off-screen killed themselves. I get why they want to be careful about that stuff. Obviously, it's a serious issue, and I don't want to make light of it or anything. But at the same time, I I feel like maybe having that warning in front of videos and having to click that you approve is sometimes worse than just a referencing it offhand in a video. None of that applies to Smile, of course, where the demon makes it look like the characters are killing themselves. But still, it's just uh, very frustrating trying to edit around a topic and event that happens in so many horror movies. I don't know, man. Just trying to navigate. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.